Good evening. My name is Uta Poiger, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. And it is a great pleasure to welcome you here to Northeastern for our fourth Morton E. Ruderman Memorial Lecture. This evening's event honors Morton E. Ruderman, who graduated from Northeastern University with a degree in engineering in 1959 and who became a champion of Jewish studies here at the university. It is my special honor this evening to welcome Morton Ruderman's children, Sharon Shapiro and Jay Ruderman. Thank you so much for being here. It's really <laughs> wonderful for us um, to have this opportunity to celebrate the legacy of your father. With the Ruderman Memorial Lecture, the Ruderman Family Foundation and the Ruderman Family have allowed Northeastern's Jewish Studies Program and the Northeastern Humanities Center to provide our university community and Boston communities with truly unique experiences. The lecture provides us with the opportunity to engage with prominent artists, writers, and intellectuals who teach us about Jewish history and culture and who at the same time raise questions of universal significance. Questions for example, about religious diversity, about Jewish diversity, about ethnic diversity, questions about truth and narrative, and questions about the complex ways in which American Jews relate to Israel and vice versa. Thank you again to the Ruderman family and the Ruderman uh, Foundation for making these engagements with Jewish religion, culture, and history, and also with the complexities of Israel possible for our students and for a broader public. Let me now turn the microphone over to my colleague, Lori Lefkowitz, who has multiple roles here at Northeastern University, roles that grow from a core commitment to the interdisciplinary field of Jewish studies. Laurie is professor of English and Ruderman professor of Jewish studies. You can see how much uh, Morton Ruderman really has shaped our university. Um, she is also the director of the Northeastern Humanities Center, which is housed in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. And Professor Lefkowitz Laurie will introduce our guest uh, this evening. So thank you, Uta Poiger. Um, and thank you all for coming to attend this year's Morton Ruderman Memorial Lecture. Um, as you heard, I direct both the Jewish Studies Program and the Northeastern Humanities Center, both in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, and the co-sponsors of tonight's occasion, featuring Jody Rudoran, um, who is in her last two, uh, last weeks, really, of um, as the uh, Jerusalem bureau chief of the New York Times, uh, and soon to assume a new position as deputy editor on the New York Times International Desk. It's really a formidable position. We are very honored to have you here at a moment when you can reflect on uh, these years. Um, the Ruderman uh, uh, Lecture is the signature event of the Jewish Studies Program, and um, I just want to reiterate our gratitude to the generosity of the Ruderman Family Foundation for enabling Northeastern to host distinguished speakers each year, people whose work in the world has a significant impact on our communities. Morton Ruderman, whom I had the privilege of knowing in the last years of his life, expressed to me a special feeling of gratitude to this university from which he received the engineering degree that launched a mightily successful career. Mort Ruderman was a lovely, gracious, and warm person. He was proud of the university's growth and distinction, and because of his love of Judaism and his love of the state of Israel, he wanted to contribute to the growth of Jewish learning here. In honoring his memory with this lectureship, the Family Foundation has asked us to bring speakers who will be important to the vital and urgent conversations on this campus and also compelling to the larger community, incentivizing the community's participation in conversations at Northeastern and on this campus. We share this value in debate as a path to growth in knowledge. So finally, I want to mention that beyond his love of Judaism in Israel, Morton and Marsha Ruderman communicated to me their unconditional and deep love for their family. And I want to recognize also Jay and Sharon, who are newly back from Israel, having celebrated a family bar mitzvah, so mazal tov. Um, and uh, 
um, among many distinguished uh, visitors and supporters of our work in this audience. The family and the foundation have my personal gratitude for your support of the Jewish Studies program, but also for the vital and life-changing work that you do promoting inclusion of people with disabilities in the Jewish community and strengthening relations between Israel and the United States Jewish community. It, the foundation's work is um, just so important, and, uh, and we thank you, and we wish you continued success. Um, our speaker. Uh, I've spent the day with Judy Redorn, and um, she has been extraordinarily generous with her time meeting with our students, teaching classes in Israel and uh, on the Israeli Arab conflict and journalism. Um, so I do want to say to you, be prepared to be dazzled by her intelligence, forthrightness, and powers of articulation. She's really extraordinary. She grew up in my new neighborhood, um, is proud of having been the editor of her high school's award-winning newspaper, The Newtonite of Newton North High. <laughs> um, she's a graduate as well of Yale University, where she received a degree in history. And in her 17 years at the New York Times, Rudoran has served as education editor, deputy metropolitan editor, Chicago bureau chief, and national education correspondent. She followed the 2004 presidential campaign, was executive producer of the multimedia series One in Eight Million, which won an Emmy for New Approaches in Documentary in 2009. Before that, she spent six years working for the Los Angeles Times. She and her husband and their eight-year-old twins, that's like job enough, um, eight-year-old twins are now busy packing up their Jerusalem home to make their way back to New York. Um, Rudoran acknowledged in the course of her conversations today that as the Jerusalem bureau chief for the New York Times, she may be the most scrutinized journalist in the world. And some have said that given the location of her beat, she may be the most important journalist in the world. Since assuming this role in 2012, she's written over 900 stories for the New York Times, covering everyday life, covering two Gaza wars, two Israeli elections. She's written about the fallout from the Iran nuclear deal, the Syrian civil war, and Palestinian ascension to international organizations. She's written news, analysis, feature stories. She's covered stone throwing, West Bank settlements, carries failed peace talks, terror attacks, hunger strikes, and internal conflicts in Israel. This list merely begins to suggest how fraught a position she occupies. Jody Redorn will speak about her work, and then I will moderate a question and answer session. At Northeastern, we encourage real conversation, and we welcome questions. We also pride ourselves on civility and hospitality, and ask you to hold your questions for the end, and as you're thinking and composing questions in your mind, um, however challenging they are, please Craft them so that they are brief and respectful. And with that, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jody Redorn. Thank you. I'm kind of exhausted from your list of <laughs> my life. Um, I turned 45 this week, uh, which feels very old, and there are a number of people in this room who have known me basically since I was born, and it's quite amazing to be speaking uh, kind of at home. Um, three generations of my cousins are here, my parents are here, uh, my parents' best friends are here, my parents' best friends' children who live in Los Angeles are here. Uh, <laughs> The man who has done my mother's hair every week since 1972 is here. <laughs> that is not a joke, it's true. Um, so uh, thank you for that, and uh, thank you to the Ruderman family uh, for inviting me. Um, I am actually married into the Ruderman family. Unfortunately, it's not this Ruderman family, but those of you who have, have followed in detail my uh, oeuvre know that my husband's uh, original name was Gary Ruderman, and my original name was Jody Wilgoran, and uh, in 2007, we combined our names to come up with this 
crazy made up name, Rudoram, which nobody can pronounce. And of course in Israel and Palestine, nobody can pronounce Jody either, so they all call me Judy, but it's okay. Um, anyway, I thought I would start tonight by, if I can, let's see if this will not fall off, by spinning the dreidel, which I'm doing not because uh, Hanukkah starts next week. Let's see if it falls. Oh well, anyway, okay. No, I, uh, I'm doing that because I've often thought about uh, this beat and this place that I've been covering for almost four years now as a place where the news happens in, in kind of a, as a rapidly, oh, I can't do it again, let's try it again as a rapidly spinning top. It's constantly moving, there's constantly stuff happening. And the question uh, for me as a journalist and for people who uh, are involved or want to be involved in the conflict itself, uh, they're, they're, they're related questions about how to deal with this rapidly spinning top. It's very rapid and a lot of stuff is happening and the real question is, is anything actually changing or is a lot of the same stuff happening over and over again? Uh, so for me as a journalist, the top, this rapidly spinning top presents two challenges. One is to kind of discern, as we can do with the dreidel. I'm having fun now, so I'm gonna keep doing it. Now, oh, there we go. Uh, I have more dreidels, actually. I have four of them, so yeah, we can do this throughout the night. It's fine, thank you. I, I think I'll be done with the dreidel, but anyway. Um, there, there are two big challenges. One is to discern if it's moving and in what direction, or is it just spinning on itself and, and kind of, again, the same thing happening over and over again. And the second is to find kind of new ways into this relentless and constantly moving and constantly screaming top to tell uh, the, a stor the stories of this place in a fresh and new and original way that will explain to people both what's happening within the spinning top and whether or not it's moving and in what direction. And the challenge for, for those of you who are interested in the outcome of the conflict or in the future of Israel or the in Palestinian national aspirations or any of the related issues around the conflict is is to kind of push the top in the direction that you want it to go. And it's pretty hard to move a rapidly spinning top. So uh, for the first two years of my work uh, in Jerusalem and of giving talks like these, I mostly talked about how it seemed like a, a rapidly spinning top where a lot was happening and nothing ever changed. Um, and that was sort of the story. I mean, Dina Kraft is here tonight who worked as a journalist uh, in Israel for a long time. And I think that for, for basically from, I guess, the end of the Second Intifada in 2005 until a couple, until maybe now, or I'm gonna maybe argue that until a year and a half ago, that was the story. A lot of stuff happening, mostly the same stuff happening over and over again, and nothing really changing, nothing fundamentally moving in the underlying situation. It seems to me, uh, as especially as I reflect on leaving, that we are now starting to see actual serious shifts <laughs> in, on a few fronts. Um, and I'm sorry to say that I think almost all of the trends are kind of negative in terms of uh, moving backwards, in terms of any resolution of the conflict, in terms of moving backwards, in terms of the uh, quality of life for a lot of people and moving backwards in terms of the level of, of violence and the lives lost. Um, they seem to be basically worse on all fronts. On the ground, of course, you know that the last couple of months have seen a new wave of terror attacks, of uh, stabbings mostly, some shootings, some vehicular attacks. More than 20 Israelis and other Jews have been killed. Um, and uh, more than 100 Palestinians, most of them attackers or, per, and, or participants in violent demonstrations have been killed. Um, this is a new kind of uprising that uh, doesn't, is not familiar, is not similar to the first or second intifadas, but is a significant change in the daily life uh, on the ground of people and, and everyone's kind of still grappling with both how to stop it and what it really means uh, and how long it might go on. It is, a, it is an uprising based on an unorganized set of individuals, most of whom have no connection to political organizations, no previous records in terms of security, and most of whom, those who are caught and talk to the police, uh, say that they decided either that morning or the day before to, to go out and attempt a stabbing. Um, this is something that the Palestinian leadership seems powerless to 
address or stop, that the security services seem quite flummoxed by how to stop, um, and that is definitely changing the atmosphere uh, in both, both sides of the divide. The second thing, uh, the second part of on the ground of where things have kind of gone backwards is, is in Gaza uh, after last summer's really truly devastating war. Uh, the situation in Gaza is, in this way, it's not so much a, a new thing, but it is a, an iteration of backward. The poverty rate has skyrocketed. The unemployment rate is over 50%. Reconstruction has barely begun. And uh, the situation in daily life on the ground in Gaza is terrible. Um, I think more significantly than the way that things have changed on the ground are some of the political changes both in the region and beyond. Uh, on the Palestinian side, the pal Palestinian political dysfunction is uh, worse than it's ever been. The rift between Hamas and Fatah is, the latest reconciliation has been a complete failure. Uh, President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, his popularity is at new lows. They have, before this uprising of violence started, there was a plan for some kind of renewed leadership and changing the membership of their various organizations. That is approximately nowhere now. There seems to be no succession plan. There seems to be no uh, real political process in place. Uh, he's an old man, as you know. He's way past his tenure, as you know. And so that situation, in terms of the Palestinians' ability to lead people in any direction is as bad as I think it's ever been. Um, I keep looking over at Dove to make sure I'm saying the correct things, yeah. Okay, good, thank you. And on the Isra in terms of Israeli politics, uh, as you probably know, there was an election this spring, um, and it has the narrowest and most conservative uh, government in a long time. Um, and the, uh, th so that presents a, a kind of a new situation, mostly in terms of, I think, Israel's uh, relationship with the world and the world's perception of Israel, which has uh, definitely receded uh, in my time there. Uh, there's an international kind of exhaustion and frustration with this conflict. Uh, there's a, the boycott movement has made significant gains, uh, not in terms of any kind of economic impact, but in terms of uh, symbolic mostly moves uh, in the time that I've been there. And there are other ways in which in Israel is increasingly uh, isolated internationally that we can talk about more uh, if you like. And then we have the profound changes that have been happening around Israel and Palestine in the region, uh, the rise of ISIS, the Iranian nuclear deal, the collapse of Syria, all of which have, I think, contributed in a negative way to the prospects for progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front. The world is increasingly consumed with these other problems and not with Israel-Palestine. And again, that combines with the kind of exhaustion and frustration I talked about before. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, Israelis are see the regional changes as evidence that uh, any concessions uh, in, in terms of the Palestinians are more dangerous than they might have been before. Excuse me for just a second. So in January of 2000, or in December of 2013, at the end of December of 2013, which was in the middle of just Secretary Kerry's nine-month peace talks, uh, came word that he planned to come to Israel, uh, come to Jerusalem on January 1st. And uh, he was like upending everybody's vacation, and he planned to come as many as three or four times in January. And I remember when I heard about this, I thought, I was really surprised. I was under the impression, based on all of my reporting, that the peace talks were going nowhere. Um, I, of course, proved to be right. But anyway, um, and my knowledge of American politics was such that I, I, also, I understood that if your signature initiative was failing, Christmas and New Year's was a good time to sort of bury it and, you know, like let it die quietly, not to kind of ratchet it up for the next year and double down. And so I thought to myself, am I? Did I miss something? Is there something going on that I don't know about? And it was as I was thinking about that that I realized something that surprised me. I realized that when I had taken this job, and in the at that time, year and a half I'd been doing the job, <clears throat> it had really never occurred to me that there would be a historic peace agreement while I was there and that I was going to you know, win a Pulitzer Prize covering it. And then, it, and then uh, one of my predecessors retired, Clyde Haberman, and he um, did a couple retirement profiles and reflected on his time in Jerusalem. And then I realized that I was probably the first New York Times bureau chief who did not take the job, presuming there would be a historic peace agreement for which they would win a Pulitzer Prize. 
And that, it really struck me, it struck me both that I was that person and that it had never even occurred to me that that was a thing. Like, it was so obvious to me that there would not be any historic change during my term because it was so obvious to everybody around me. Nobody I talked to thought there was gonna be a historic peace agreement during that time. Um, a little while later, uh, so then the, t the talks collapsed, as you know, and uh, three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped and killed in the West Bank, as you know, and a Palestinian teenager was kidnapped and killed in East Jerusalem, as you know, and then a 50-day war between Hamas uh, militants and Israel broke out, and, and it last, this is in the summer of 2014. At the end of that war, I was having dinner with some friends, one of whom was uh, Bradley Burston, who's a fairly, well, very radical left-leaning columnist for Haaretz. And he had recently written a column saying that he did not think there would be a historic peace deal in his lifetime. And a lot of his friends in America, and by America I mean Berkeley, because we're talking about Bradley Burston, um, a lot of his liberal, radical, left-leaning friends were very angry at him for sort of giving up the dream and you know saying this out loud, that there would not be a historic peace agreement. And I just laughed, and we all kind of laughed because I said, it's, from, this, from where we were sitting, the question wasn't whether there was gonna be a historic peace agreement in Bradley's lifetime. The question was whether there was gonna be a Jewish democratic Israel in his kid's lifetime. And I think that in the time, in the year since then, that has become clearer and clearer. That the, and I think it's, you know, it's quite clear from here it's less clear from over there. Israelis are less in tune with that question as a choice. But I think increasingly, the choice is not between maintaining the status quo and having a two-state solution, which is what Israelis particularly have seen their choices as for the last, what would we say, 30 years, right? Um, but the question really is between a two-state solution and Israeli survivability. I mean, is this period, I think we have some big picture historians in the crowd who study the Holy Land back in hundreds and thousands of years ago. The question now is, is this period going to one day be one of many periods when Jews had a presence in the Holy Land? Or is Israel going to continue and you know, thrive as, as a modern democracy? And I think that you know, the more that question becomes what people are focused on, the more possibilities there are for change. Because, you know, the Israelis do not want to live, I don't think Israeli Jews that I have met over these last four years want to live either in a state that is, has a majority of Palestinian or Arab population, and I also don't think they want to live in a state where they, you know, rule aggressively in an apartheid fashion over four million Palestinians. So, or six million Palestinians, I guess. Um, so, what I see beyond all of these <laughs> specific negative changes, what, what, is, what we see there is a, a growing sense of hopelessness on both sides. Uh, on the Palestinian side, a real, a deep and pervasive hopelessness about their individual futures and certainly a hopelessness about the process of, prospects of a state. Uh, on the Israeli side, we see a, a deep and pervasive hopelessness about the possibility of peace and security and uh, that their children and their children's children will not have to serve in another war with the Palestinians. It's, it's certainly true that sometimes things do have to get worse before they get better and that maybe things getting worse is what provokes things to get better and maybe that's what we're about to see in the coming years, I don't know. But one thing that's definitely gotten worse, one divide that I've seen grow, is, this, uh, is, the, is the divide over the narratives, the dueling narratives. And that's one of the, I mean, we taught, and the title of my talk was uh, Journalism in a Land of Few Facts. And what I mean by that is that there's precious little that Israelis and Palestinians would sort of consider axiomatic. Uh, there's precious few reliable narrators who don't have some partisan agenda to promote. Everything, including the language that we use to discuss the conflict or even to discuss you know, the weather is loaded with double meanings and political baggage. Um, I talk often about conflict code, where the word disputed doesn't mean a place where people are fighting over. It means a right-wing alternative to the word occupied for the West Bank. Um, this often, uh, 
one of the things that we may discuss it with your questions and one of the criticisms that advocates often make about my coverage has to do with context and background and why wasn't this you know, other thing that is vaguely connected to the thing you're writing about. Why wasn't this included or why wasn't that included? Um, you know, why did you say that this, the, the, why did you say that the uprising in Jerusalem dates back to the uh, kidnapping and killing of Muhammad Abu Khtair from East Jerusalem, from Shufat, but not mention Gilad and Iyal and uh, Naftali who were kidnapped three weeks before in the West Bank. You know, why, why, why did you say, why did you mention 67 but not 48? Why did you mention Baruch Goldstein but not uh, the riots of 1929? Um, and I often joke that every 800 word news story seems like I should have in there a paragraph that says, Abraham had two sons, there was Isaac and there was Ishmael. But that's not, that's not possible. <laughs> so we struggle and we try to do what's best, not just for the people who know everything that they need to know about the conflict from other sources, but from people who, around the world, people in, I think I said earlier this week, in Nebraska and Nepal, who rely on the New York Times to explain to them what's going on in this very special place. I recently discovered a colleague of mine who covers uh, uh, Washington, wrote to me to tell me I'd really reached the pinnacle of fame. I was very excited. I was in the Hillary Rodham Clinton email trove that was turned over to Congress. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was great. It was an email from Sidney Blumenthal to Hillary that said she should get an early scoop. And it was written before I took this job. Uh, after, so my announce, the announcement of me getting this job had been announced on Twitter and a bunch of congratulations had come on Twitter and I had engaged on Twitter with some of these people congratulating me. And I was immediately branded by the pro-Israel right as a self-hating Jewish traitor or something like that. Uh, one of my big sins was that I had written to somebody to thank them for, for congratulating me. I had written shukran, which is thank you in Arabic. It was a learn I had, word I had learned about 15 minutes earlier. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, it, was, it was an interesting welcome to this beat. So Sydney. Blumenthal, who I guess had had a thing about this, the, the pro-Israel lobby and how it related to the media, said, you know, was defending me to Hillary and saying my job as a reporter is to reach out to a wide variety of interested parties. I don't want to read this whole thing to you. And he said, he said, the situation is not healthy for the United States or for Israel. If Americans get a one-sided diet of reportage about this conflict, we are going to misunderstand it and we are going to keep making stupid or ill-informed decisions. We're also going to be less capable of giving our Israeli friends sensible advice, which all states need from time to time. Israel's staunchest backers shouldn't want a cheerleader at the Times Jerusalem Bureau. In fact, the more you care about Israel, the more you want someone who'll tell you the truth, even when some of it might not be pleasant to read or hear. Otherwise, you might not find out what's really happening until it's too late. I was thinking about this a lot as I've fielded various criticisms about our coverage of the latest wave of violence. One of the tropes from the pro-Israel crowd um, about this coverage is that we write too much about the attackers and not enough about the victims, and that, we, that our, our attempts to humanize the attackers or to explain their lives to people is somehow uh, creating some kind of moral equivalence between attackers and victims, and that it's just wrong to kind of speak of them as people when they're just terrorists and they should be dismissed as terrorists. And I find this line of criticism deeply disturbing and also kind of just bizarre. I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I, the idea that anyone who cares about this place and who cares about what happens to Israel would not want to know what, who these attackers are and what the hell made them pick up a knife or a scissors and go out and try to stab Jews it strikes me as a, a kind of, of small mind in myopia that is really, really dangerous and scary. It's, it's shocking to me that they would not understand that th those, the motivations for people and the stories of their lives and the story, for example, that I wrote about East Jerusalem uh, a few weeks ago uh, has an intense impact on the future of Israeli security and Israeli sustainability. I was also thinking about this recently, just over the last few days, we've had all these shocking, violent things happen here in our own country. And the New York Times has done a very extensive and deep profile, uh, just one yesterday and one a few days before, on Robert Deere Jr., who shot up the Planned Parenthood 
uh, in Colorado Springs. And I was wondering whether the same uh, readers that have been complaining about our coverage of Palestinian attackers, didn't, did they not want to know who Robert Deere was? It seems very obvious to me from a journalistic perspective that you need to know who Robert Deere was and everything you can find out about him so that you can try to understand what would make him go shoot up a Colorado Planned Parenthood clinic. Um, and actually, I mean, I'm sorry to tell you this, I, I think we should also, you know, humanize and find out as much as we can about any victims of violence, but really it's actually more important who the attackers are than who the victims are in terms of understanding because the victims are relatively random, right, or basically totally random, and it's, you know, they didn't, who, what happened to them before didn't bring them to becoming victims. What happened to Robert Deere Jr. or to the Palestinian attackers may tell us something about something deeper in our societies that needs addressing. It may not, but anyway, in any case, I really do believe that our, 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 our job is to explain all of this stuff, to tell you about the victims and about the attackers, and to tell you about the places where they lived and where they attacked and what, what everything means if, as best as we can, and to try to balance those things out. Sidney Blumenthal's email was also really ironic to me because his son, Max Blumenthal, became one of my most hateful and vigorous and unprofessional and really insane attackers. He, he wrote a thousands and thousands of word uh, takedown of a video that my husband prepared uh, for his parents when he went for their 60th wedding anniversary. It was a video, he realized that my, his parents were too sick and were never gonna be able to visit us in Jerusalem, so he wrote, he made this video about his life in Jerusalem in which I make a sort of cameo appearance. And this guy, Max Blumenthal, decided that this was a, an opportunity to criticize me and say that I live in a Zionist bubble and you know I'm a terrible uh, reporter and have no credibility. It's part of a, of a whole uh, industry of attack advoca of, of advocacy on both sides that attacks journalism, that sees undermining my credibility and journalists' credibility as a tool in the conflict. Uh, I think it's a reflection of the general kind of devolution of the conflict and the extent to which people, activists, who, who I think do deeply care about the outcome of the conflict and about their side, have decided for a reason that I don't really understand that undermining journalism is, a, is going to help their cause. I never did get the scoop from Hillary's State Department. I'm sorry to tell you. I wish I'd known uh, before <laughs> that they had promised me one. But anyway, uh, I have been thinking in the last few days as I prepare to leave the place about some of the stories that, that I think were most memorable and most significant that I've been able to do while I was there. Uh, early in my, in my time there, I wrote a piece about uh, children and grandchildren of Auschwitz survivors who had chosen to tattoo on their own arms the numbers of their survivor relatives. And I thought that was a really, I'll never forget those, those pictures of uh, those people and what they said about their, about their reasoning. Just more recently, I profiled an artist called Nita Badwan, a woman who uh, was an artist in Gaza who had been so sort of suffocated by Hamas and by the situation that she had retreated to her room, locked herself in her room, and for two months she basically lay down on the floor crying, but then, she spent more than a year in her room, and during the next few months, she created an amazing series of self-portraits. And my article was translated into Hebrew and ran on the cover of the Idiot Achronot supplement, and all these Israeli Jews went to see her work at an East Jerusalem gallery where they'd never been, and, and Nida has uh, since gotten out of Gaza and shown her work in Italy, and that's pretty cool. I made several trips to Jordan, uh, to the Zatari refugee camp, where I wrote several stories about Syrian refugees, and you know, that will, uh, the, the images of, of life in those camps and the ways both that people are desperate and that people are resilient and, and turning that camp into a thriving society of its own uh, will never leave my, my heart or my mind. Um, I did a, before the election, I worked with an interactive data team to do a project on Netanyahu's record on settlements that told people a lot of things they didn't know and un, uncovered a, or explained a lot of stereotypes and presumptions about his record, uh, mostly that he has not built any more settlements than anybody else. Um, then last summer I worked with another uh, great team to do a project called Gaza Walks in which we 
picked several characters from the Israeli side and the Gaza side of the fence and kind of took readers or users on a, on a walk in their path, uh, their daily path with using a new technology. And that was really exciting. One of the stories that will just always stay in my heart was a piece I did uh, on Israeli Memorial Day about, I called it the Gilad generation. It was about an American woman who had moved to Israel, had a baby, moved back to New York, and then moved back to Israel. And her son, she had only one son, and he was killed on the first day of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And every year since 1973, a small group of, of people, about 50 people, had gone to an individual memorial service uh, for Gilad every year for more than 40 years. And as you know, if you've been in Israel on uh, Yom Azikaron on Memorial Day, you know that it's a, a true national day of mourning. It's nothing like our Memorial Day here. Uh, there are lots of big ceremonies, and there are lots of these small ceremonies all around Israel where people uh, gather and comfort each other, and they take it all very, very personally. What struck me about this, this woman's story was that, you know, 40 years later, all the people in the room also knew other people who had been killed in other wars, but they still came uh, to her, and 23 of them had actually named their children Gilad, most of them not, um, not related to her. And that's why we called it the Gilad generation. Anyway, I got a text message the day that story ran from a Palestinian official. And the text message said, your lack of empathy for Palestinians is unbelievable. And I was confused at first. I was like, what, what is this about? You know, I, I don't have a story about Palestinians in the paper. I have a story about this woman, this American Israeli woman and her son, who was not killed by Palestinians, who was killed by Egyptians. And I, I just, at first I couldn't figure it out, and, and then I understood that what he was saying was that to have empathy for her and for the Gilad generation and for Israelis meant necessarily not to have empathy for Palestinians. And I thought, now we are really, really in trouble. Because if empathy itself has become a zero-sum game, if empathy for one set of people means no empathy for the other set of people, I do not think that bodes well for conflict resolution. So, you know, I've tried to show, and I've certainly felt empathy for virtually everybody that I've met in four years of covering this crazy place. Um, and I think that empathy is a key tool for journalism. I think it's a key tool for conflict resolution. I think it's a key tool just for being a human being. So I have enough for both, <laughs> and I'm sorry that he doesn't, and I hope that you all do as well. Happy to take your questions. We are going to move this mic here and invite people to line up. Um, and uh, until that happens, I'll start by taking questions from Professor Kaufman. Thank you so much. First of all, I just have to say your title was wonderful, a very important title. I wanted to also suggest, I, both in your presentation, your choice of topics, um, I don't know how many bureau chiefs before you were women, but I- One. One. I want to ask you if you think gender has played a role, both in the way in which you practice your journalism and the way in which people evaluate you and the work that you do. And closely related to that is the, the issue of narrative itself uh, as a method and as a way of telling stories. And that we sometimes imagine that telling stories is quite different from factual information. And of course, they are the same. And finally, um, if you- You should be taking notes on the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just very quickly that it's not just uh, journalism that needs the empathy, but all the social sciences. And as a social scientist, this is what I guess I've been writing about for years. So again, thank you. And would you address the gender issue? Yeah, I'll do my best. So um, so there was one uh, bureau chief before me who was a woman, Debbie Sontag, who was there, I think, from 1998 to 2001 or so. Um, 
and I, I told the story earlier, so forgive me if you were there, but um, during the, Gaza, the first Gaza war I covered in 2012, we sort of realized all of a sudden that there were six women sitting around the table filing and realized we were all women and we thought that was kind of cool and we wrote, wrote on Facebook about it and then some people wrote articles about it and Debbie kind of wrote me a nasty note saying like, I was a woman covering the Lebanon war and we had other women and you know, so we stand on their shoulders. Um, I think it has, I think you asked the question in a really smart way. Um, so there's a superficial way in which gender does definitely affect the coverage because the societies that we work in are very uh, gender uh, based, uh, both especially Muslim society, but also certainly ultra-Orthodox society. Um, there are places that women can't go and places that only women can go. So there's a, some doors that are closed. I spoke earlier about, I thought about doing a big profile of Avadja Yosef. I realized that it would be basically impossible to do, and I didn't try. I also, during that same first Gaza war, was able to get into the widow's tent from the uh, major guy, major, major Hamas guy, who was assassinated at the start of the war, and it was a place no male reporter could go. A much better example of the benefits of being a woman covering Muslim society is my colleague Alyssa Rubin, who is the Kabul bureau chief and the Baghdad bureau chief. And she has written extensively, particularly about the Afghanistan war, about women. And in, again, in ways that you know a man could never have ever gotten access to the stories she's gotten access to. And so, so you need men and women to cover certain things. Um, I think that. I will also I will say I guess two more things. One is that I definitely think that being a woman has colored or affected and maybe worsened some of the ways in which I've been attacked. Uh, the number of times in which amid a stream of Twitter attacks there is a reference to my weight or my looks is quite striking. The, it's particularly striking that there are all these references to my weight since I uh, lost 75 pounds a few years ago and people are constantly writing about my obesity which does not exist anymore. So I like to respond to those, but um, I don't think that there are men who get that kind of public criticism about their looks. Um, I also don't care. I mean, I think that most of the, you know, people who write in, it exposes people as being profoundly unprofessional and ridiculous when they write about people's weight or looks or whatever, so it kind of kills itself off. Um, but empathy, let's get to empathy, because that's where it's really interesting, right? Do, are, do women reporters more uh, use empathy as a tool than male reporters? I don't know. Do women reporters speak more openly about empathy as a tool of journalism than men do? I bet. Um, I'll tell you what, I wrote a story uh, in the spring of 2014, late spring, after the kidnapping of the three Israeli teenagers. It was a story in which I basically twinned together interview profiles of the mother of Naftali Frankel and the mother of a Palestinian who was killed during a demonstration. There were some cl complaints about moral equivalency here. There was no moral equivalency. There was simply a, 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 a present presentation of two people's experiences that were happening at the same time and that had some things in common and a lot of things not in common. Anyway, I got one of my favorite compliments ever about that story. Uh, and it, they, what the person said was that they, they didn't really know didn't always know how to quantify this question you're asking about when it, when something when it mattered that something was written by a woman, but they said they knew that story was written by a mother, and I thought that was a really nice compliment. Uh, early in your talk, you mentioned the dysfunctional nature of the Palestinians, um, and clearly the uh, Hamas and the PA being different parties uh, is, is important there. I'm curious uh, what, you, what you think about the role that the U.S. has played in, in a way, sabotaging Hamas as a possible uh, partner in moving toward peace. We didn't recognize them after they were elected. Uh, and there have been all sorts of threats about what would happen if the Palestinian Authority somehow did right. manage to work with them. And I, I'm just curious what your sense of That's that. a good question, and I'll tell you, it's 
a rare question that I do not get asked frequently. So, uh, you know, I, I, I recently went to a briefing by Tony Blair, who, as you probably know, because he has some kind of, I don't know, masochistic streak, has decided to, to after he's finished his role at the quartet, he is now doing an, on his own initiative some kind of Middle East initiative, which is very unlikely to have any impact, so you don't need to necessarily pay attention to it. But one of the things he's doing is basically, he didn't fully acknowledge it, but is dealing with Hamas in a way that he felt unable to as part of the quartet or as the leader of Britain. And I think his perspective is kind of like they're there, so you got to deal with them. Uh, and I do think there's something to that, and I, I do think there's something problematic. I mean, there's something problematic about you know not dealing with the democratically elected people. They, I mean, they're not democratically elected anymore. Now nobody's democratically elected over there, but they were. And there's also obviously something problematic about dealing with terrorists. But I think I think your question gets at at kind of a larger fundamental challenge for both Israel and the U.S., um, which is that there are many, 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 many reasons or excuses or rationalizations or explanations of what is wrong with the Palestinians that make it, many people say impossible, I would use the word difficult, to try to imagine any kind of normal process of resolving conflict with them or coming to an agreement with them. So you can sort of say, well, there's no Palestinian partner, well, there's Palestinian division, well, Hamas is terrorist, and so we can't do any of that with them. And you can say that, and you have a lot of good reasoning on your side to feel right about the idea that you can't negotiate with terrorists or you can't uh, trust this partner or you, you know, how could Abbas even sign an agreement when the Palestinians are divided? All of those things are completely true and have a lot of credibility. Except what is the alternative? You know? It's like this is what you have to deal with, U.S. and Israel. So if, and what will happen if you don't do it? That's what I think people need to focus on a little bit more and they are starting to. And that's what I mean by the reframing of the question, because great, don't negotiate with Hamas. Don't negotiate with Abbas, because you don't think he can bring the people. Don't negotiate with anyone, fine. Call, you know, let me know where things are in 10 years. I don't think they're gonna be better for you. So I think that, I, 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 I don't, I haven't fully thought through what the policy implications are for the US of engaging Hamas or how they would do it, but I, I do think that the kind of throwing up your hands because your opponents or enemies or neighbors are difficult or much more than difficult people is not going to accomplish your own goals. Jody, thank you. My name is Gilad, not of the Gilad generation. Oh, that would have been so great if you were, it was like a whole movie going on. But I am, uh, I am perhaps uh, one of the people included in what you described as the pro-Israel crowd. And I think you, misunderstood or maybe misstated the, the complaint that many of us have about New York Times coverage, which one of them is that the newspaper has a tendency to downplay violence against Israelis, certainly relative to the way it handles Israelis when they, when they on occasions when they do act violently. For example, when some teenage Israeli thugs beat up a boy named Jamal Julani pretty badly, um, he was in the hospital for three days, and that story ended up here in Boston, at least, on the front page, top of the fold, not once, but twice in the New York Times with long, detailed features. Um, but when you look back a year earlier when the Fogel family, uh, when members of the Fogel family were slaughtered, five people, including three children, as you know, um, in, in a really brutal way that shook Israel, which, which is even used to violence, um, that story ended up in, in a brief on page six, I think, and then uh, page five, and then maybe on page 16, uh, the follow-up story. And so that, that's more of the concern we have. And you acknowledge, I think, in New York that the newspaper did downplay uh, or didn't, didn't give enough sort of um, ink to the Fogel family and also pointed out, I think, rightly, that this was before your tenure. But the concern is that this, this tendency continues, has continued um, throughout your tenure as well. For example, just a couple weeks ago, there was a stabber in Jerusalem near the Damascus Gate and he was caught on video by MSN, not Fox News, by MSNBC cameras, holding, run, rushing towards Israel, he's holding a knife. And the New York Times never once mentioned this video. 
which is which would be probably problematic enough. This isn't exactly Isa and you know uh, Abraham had two sons. This was certainly relevant to the story, and it was more problematic because it did cite witnesses witnesses on the Palestinian side who insisted that Israel planted the knife next to him, and and readers never were given any clear indication that that in fact there is empirical evidence that that's not true, uh, and that's the kind of thing that you know. We saw your colleague, Dia Hadid, refer to Palestinians who stoned a car killing the Israeli as throwing stones at the road and not at the driver or the car, which is another way that people feel like Palestinian violence is downplayed. And so my, my question, I guess, specifically is, don't you agree that the video of the uh, man holding a knife is relevant to helping readers understand what actually happened to that incident? There were three stories mentioning it. None of them mentioned the video. And I guess I'll leave it that specific. No, I guess is the answer. But um, so, uh, sorry. So, um, okay. First of all, I don't. I don't think there were three stories mentioning that incident. But the main story that you're talking about, which is a story that I wrote, was not really about the incident. Actually, the lead of the story was the story. It was quoting a guy who said the story of Sharuk that is told here is not the story Israelis tell. And the whole story was about the issue of dueling narratives. And that whole incident at the Damascus Gate was not included in the article is, as a way of figuring out did the kid have a knife or not. It was included entirely as a mechanism to discuss the fact that the Palestinians were telling a story that was not based in fact about the planting of knives. And the story did not, you're sorry, right, it didn't cite the video, it was a very short story. It did, however, cite that there was a picture of a knife that next to the kid that the police circulated and clearly he did have a knife. It clearly stated that he had a knife. It clearly stated that the people were talking about him not having a knife or were denying that he had a knife. Um, and the whole point of it was the idea that the narratives are separate. So that's about that story. Um, I'm really glad you brought up this Julani Fogel thing because at the event on Monday night, uh, people tried to ask this question and they didn't mention Julani, and I didn't understand what other incident they were talking about. I, I can't really can't speak to the Fogel coverage. I wasn't there. I do think it was underplayed, which is what I said Monday night. I think the Julani case, I forgot the name, but that's the sort of lynch of that was happened while I was there, right? So I'll tell you why we wrote a big story about that. Um, it has nothing to do with the Fogels, but why we wrote a big story about that was because of what it said about Israelis. It really wasn't about that kid at all. It was where I wrote the second story in, in, in effect. It was really about this kind of massive self-reflection and tearing apart of Israeli society that happened in the aftermath of that, the way the discussion unfolded. It was one of the things we're very, very interested in is, is the kind of rifts within Israel, uh, political rifts, but also identity rifts, cultural rifts, and that's what that second story was about. I was involved, I, I know Isabel wrote the first story, and then I worked with her on the second story. I think I went to uh, the Yad Biyad school and interviewed some kids about it, if I remember correctly. Um, in any case, I think that, you know, it, as I said on Monday night, a better, if the question is about, you know, parallel cases, I do think the two twin kidnappings and, uh, 2014 are a better example of that, and I think our coverage was, it wasn't, you don't line it up and count words. I think there were clearly more stories about the Israelis than there was about Mohammed al -Qusir, but I think they were both covered fairly and fully and in a, in a balanced way. I think it's just profoundly untrue that we cover violence against Palestinians more aggressively than we cover violence against Israelis. It's certainly, look, the, the Duma case, the burning of the Duabsa family, that was more unusual than, you know, the case of, of uh, Palestinian attacks on Israelis. So things that are more unusual are, have a higher kind of news value. That's how journalism works. And I think the, the real problem in your question is that it, it reflects a kind of scoreboard mentality that is reductive and naive about both how the world works and how journalism works. The idea of trying to understand our coverage or this conflict by counting the number of stories or frankly the number of people who are killed uh, is really simplistic and naive. I mean, going to the Gaza war, for example, you know, vastly more Palestinians in Gaza were killed in the summer of 2014 than Israelis were killed. That does not mean that the war was more devastating to Palestinians or to Gaza than it was to Israel. And you know, it, things happen in different, play out in different societies in different ways. 
Numbers do not tell this whole story. And it's particularly problematic in analyzing our journalism because it, it suggests that any individual story or any individual sentence is either pro or anti-Israel, which is just not the case. Constantly getting these letters about like the number of words or the number of quotes in this column or that column, and it's just not how we do our business. It's not how we think, and I don't think it's how normal readers think. I really don't. And so you can count up bylines and how many things mention this or that, but but you, it's it's very uh, it's really uh, myopic, and I think it's also distorting because for example, you know, you've just given this example of this domestic gate incident, but you've totally misinterpreted what that article was supposed to be. So you can say what you want about it, but it's not what it, it's not how I wrote it, and it's not how anybody who's not an advocate would have read it. Hi, Jody. Uh, my name's Marshall. I'm, I'm a student at like a journalism class. So good for you. Yeah. Um, what I thought was really interesting when you're talking about like you know like the zero sum of empathy, and like how like the contrast between like the human desire you know to pick one side, and also like desire for empathy. But my question is, is like, what can I, you know, or what can we, as um, as college students, like, based on your experience, like, what can we do to help, like, and like this conflict based on like your experiences over there? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm not in the business of ending or starting conflicts. I'm in the business of understanding what's going on. So I can tell you what you can do to try to understand what's going on, which is to read as widely as you possibly can from all different kinds of sources, and to go there and to talk to all different kinds of people. And I think to see them as people and not as representatives of institutions or factions or points of view, but really as individuals. Try to understand how they think. Try to learn as much as you can about their experiences, and then try to synthesize that with what you know from your own life and your own classes and figure out what, then maybe you'll be able to figure out what you think is a way to end the conflict. I, you know, I've known for myself for, for a long time that my kind of role in life, my position in the world is as an observer and not as an actor. And so I don't think that way. I don't think about how conflicts would get ended. But I, I think a lot about how to figure out what's going on. And I think those are the best tools I have. Thanks. poli-sci class on the conflict. I actually want to ask something not so much related to the conflict, and I wanted to ask for us who don't read Hebrew, who don't read Arabic, who are pretty much limited to the American sources like the New York Times, from your experience on the ground um, and seeing the work of your Arab, Palestinian, and Israeli Jewish colleagues, how different is their work? What are the stories they're chasing? What are the stories they're writing? What, do, what does their audience demand? And therefore, what stories are we missing and have we missed during your time? That's a great question. And actually, I, I don't think this is necessarily true in the whole world, but it's really true in Israel and Palestinian uh, society that there is actually a remarkable amount of journalism available in English. So, and I would encourage you to do some of the reading yourself. You can, on the Israeli side, there, um, Ynet, Haaretz, the Times of Israel, and the Jerusalem Post, and also, some smaller outlets like Arutz Sheva and also Israel Hayom all have English websites. You can read extensively news from Israel in English any day of the week, and you can sign up for Haaretz alerts. They alert every single news story that ever crossed the path, and you, they can, it'll be fun for you. Uh, on the Palestinian side, you can look at Ma News and also at Wafa, which is the official Palestinian Authority news agency. They both translate some things into English. Um, and you can also read, like in Al Monitor, they have a lot of uh, good stuff. There's also Al Jazeera English. Um, so there's quite a lot of English out there. Um, the coverage uh, in the Palestinian journalism and Israeli journalism is quite different from each other and quite different from international journalism. Uh, it is highly politicized. Each, each publication has a clear point of view. The line between editorials and news coverage that we're very familiar with in America doesn't really exist there. Uh, Palestinian journalism is generally see, perceived as part, as, as, a, as a nationalistic thing to do. You are involved in the Palestinian national liberation struggle by being a journalist. There's a lot of pressure to kind of participate in that. There's not a lot of 
Uh, there's not terribly much investigative journalism on either side. There's quite a lot of great columnists, I would say, on both sides, particularly in Israel. Um, the, the, the sort of news coverage tends to be very fast, very aggressive, very competitive, and therefore very thin. But the commentating is quite insightful, I think, on both sides. Um, so, and I, one thing that I've noticed, I noticed it first in the Gaza 2014 war, um, and then again in the last couple of months, is that at the times of heated conflict, the is both journalisms become more uh, politicized and more, um, I mean, for example, almost all Israeli media outlets use the word terrorist to describe kind of everybody carrying a knife even if they're at dinner, you know, like it's really, and, but that, and I don't think they were necessarily doing that six months ago, but it's become increasingly. Um, there was a, there was a, one of these dueling narrative things I, I was really like, my head was spinning from a few weeks ago. There was this, um, there was this incident in Hebron uh, where a, a guy, was, a, a Jewish guy was driving a truck, uh, his car was hit by rocks, he got out of the truck with a like baseball bat in order to, um, you know, I don't know, defend himself or something, and then he was run over. He was then run over by somebody. And then I think the attacker was killed by some Israelis, I think. I can't remember the specifics, but the Palestinian rendering of this was that the guy, you know, was like smashing windows with the baseball bat, that that started the whole thing, which was so clearly not true. Um, but there was no mention of, I mean, there's just, the, the biggest problem with the dueling narratives right now is, and it's, it's enhanced by these video clips that are going around social media, um, is, is the ignoring of all counter narrative. I mean, I think there's one thing when it, I think when I, the beginning of the dueling narratives for me, the beginning, and I think there's lots of books like this, is, you know, different interpretations of the same event. But what we have now is just, total ignoring of any counter information as opposed to kind of deprogramming of counter information, which is what you think of as a narrative, a narrative war. This is like, I mean, you know, when, when uh, Mahmoud Abbas stood up and talked about the Manasra kids and he said that Israel had, this was the 14 and 16 year olds who in Beit Hanina who had attacked uh, a 14 year old on a bike in Piskat Ze'ev and also a 25 year old with knives. Uh, one of them was shot and killed, the other one was shot and injured, and Mahmoud Abbas made this speech where he talked about Israel uh, executing in cold blood Ahmed Manasra, who was in fact alive and well in an Israeli hospital and being treated. So what people really freaked out about was that he had mis mistakenly referred to the wrong kid, the one who was alive instead of the one who was dead, which is really stupid of him. But um, what I was more kind of, interested in and what I thought was more profoundly uh, telling was that he just ignored the fact that they had knives. You know, I mean, what would be wrong with sort of saying it is a profound tragedy that any teenager would pick up a knife and attack another teenager and nobody should be shot in the street and this, this kid, there was video of this kid being yelled at and called racist names and no, everyone ignored him while he was bleeding in the street. Uh, it's unclear to me why somebody can't say, he had a knife, that is wrong, <coughs> letting him bleed out in the street is also wrong. You know what I mean? And it's this kind of ignoring of the other side and that's what we're seeing increasingly in the media is telling of parts of the story. I think it's, it's much worse in the Palestinian media than in the Israeli media. Hi. I'm a journalism student, so my question is a little more journalism than on the conflict. I can do journalism. Um, <laughs> so, a uh, point you made earlier about sort of covering attackers versus victims, whether it's shootings or stabbings, whatever the instance be, um, and the importance of sort of profiling the attacker was very interesting to me. It's not something I've learned in classes before. So, I'm wondering uh, sort of two parts. One, how you uh, respond to the traditional criticism that, you know, uh, profiling an attacker is glorifying him or um, glorifying the action. And secondly, since we're talking about empathy um, in coverage of victims and attackers, is one group more deserving of empathy than the other, more or less? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, she's a journalism student. She was asking about this question of 
profiling or humanizing victims of violence and attackers of violence. She said, um, the end of the question is, is one group deserving of more empathy than the other? And the other, oh, and the other question was, is there a concern that profiling an attacker is glorifying him or her? And, and I, you didn't say this, but maybe and might lead others to, to want to uh, commit violent acts. Let's add that, okay? Um, I should say also, I'm thrilled that we had all these students asking questions, even though there's all these old people in the audience. So. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, <coughs> Let's start with the end. Is one person serving more of empathy than the other? I, I, don't, I don't have the dictionary definition of empathy in my, uh, at my fingertips here, but I think it means something like, you know, trying to see things from the other person's perspective, trying to understand them, you know, trying to feel them the way they feel them or see them the way they see them. I think that's different from sympathy, right? Which is kind of, Where's an English professor? Could I have some help? But I mean, so sympathy, I think, and there's probably even another better word that really implies like feeling sorry for, uh, you know. This, what, uh. Anyway, I think what you're, I think that empathy as a tool for understanding can be applied in equal measure to really horrible, murderous people who you need to understand because it tells you something about something that's going on in your society, and also to victims of those people who, of course, understanding what happened to them is also important as in terms of the toll of this horrible trend in your society. I think I, I, it's hard, I mean, equal measure sort of gets to me a little bit like uh, the zero-sum game. I'm not so... I don't, I don't even know how to measure empathy, so I don't know if it can be applied in equal measure, but I think you should, I think it's, for me, it's a tool, to, a tool of understanding, and I think, it, I think it should be equally available to all types of people, murderers and victims alike. I would say certainly sympathy doesn't need to have the same equal measure. I don't think you have to feel good about a murderer in order to empathize with them. I think empathy is about understanding. I guess that's my, maybe I'm, I, it's po totally possible I'm using the word incorrectly. Um, distinction. Okay, thank you. Um, the glorification is a really important point, and it's one I've, I've uh, wrestled with personally and been uh, vilified for publicly in a way that I think is also profoundly misunderstanding my work, so I'm happy to have a chance to, to talk about it. Um, for the, the glorification accusation came maybe most aggressively uh, in a story I did in 2013 that profiled a kid, a 17-year-old kid in Beit Umar, who uh, as he was a stone thrower, and he was from a family of stone throwers and a village of stone throwers. And I had, I had started on that story, you'll remember my Let's see if I can do it in my rapidly spinning top. And I talked about the difficulty of, of, of not only discerning where it's going, but of getting into it in a new way, journalistic challenge. So I had been there a while, and I, it struck me that the Palestinian stone thrower was this kind of caricatured figure in the conflict and was constantly in these news stories. Somebody was throwing stones in a class or at a car or whatever, and it, there was no uh, depth to this character. It was a character that was in our imagination in this very flat way, constantly referred to. Same, also settlers, by the way, not very three-dimensional or humanized in our coverage. And I, so I set out to do a story that was like, well, who are Palestinian stone throwers and what makes them tick and how does it work? Literally, how do you learn how to use the slingshot? Who makes the slingshot? And, you know, is it something that, how do parents feel about these kids? And what, is, what happens with them when they get arrested in school? And what is, you know, I just, it was just really like, who the hell is the Palestinian thro stone thrower? And the goal was to make a flat figure and a caricature into a real person in three dimensions. So it was to humanize this character. It was not to glorify him, okay? Um, so this guy, I ended up finding this crazy family of stone throwers, and I ended up witnessing the, this middle of the night arrest, and it, there was a lot of good journalistic fodder in this piece. And one of the things that the lead character said, which was the lead quote in the story, was uh, that it was his hobby to throw stones. It was like, for him, it was, people have hobbies. This is my hobby. I forget the exact quote. I, I bet our friend, oh, he left. Oh, no, there you are. You might know the quote, because I know, do you know the quote? Do you remember the, anyway, there's a quote about him like, it being a hobby. So I thought, to me, this, to me, this struck me as like, 
Oh my God, he thinks this violent action is a hobby. That is kind of shocking. And that's why I made it the third paragraph. I thought it was very telling, a very profound quote. It was a 17 year old's quote. It was a teenager talking. It felt like a teenager talking. It felt like a complete misunderstanding of what he was doing. Um, and that's why it was the lead quote. And the, for now more than two years, people have been saying that what I was saying was that I think it's a hobby and that I think that's fine, which is not at all what I was saying. Um, and there was this notion that I was glorifying it. I think I was making it look uh, you know, horrible and scary and pathetic. I was explaining it. I was explaining it. And I was explaining also that there, also later in the story, it talked about how there were no movie theaters in Beit Umar and there was very little to do there. And that's one of the reasons kids throw stones. Um, and that their fathers threw stones and that they, you know, whatever. There was a lot of, um, it was a long story and I spent a lot of time working on it and it was quite nuanced and I think probably, a, you know, the most sophisticated portrait of Palestinian stone throwers out there. But it was not regarded as that. It was regarded, and oh, by the way, the Palestinians hated this story too. Um, including the activists from Beit Umar who I'd worked with. So, um, Anyway, but it, it was not glorifying him at all. And it was readers who decided to glorify him. So I, I, I don't know. I think the copycat issue is a, is a real serious issue. And we've seen, not through, I think, mainstream media coverage, but we've seen through social media and videos the way that, that copycats are playing out in this wave of violence. It's troubling. But I think that the, the, the need for people to understand what's going on is more my responsibility than that potential repercussion. Jimmy, I see that we have uh, two people waiting in line. We'll take these two questions, and then we'll wrap it up. If I can keep it short, maybe we can get three. Maybe we can get three. If there was a third person that was If people have yes or no questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Unfortunately, my, que my question is not a yes or no. Okay. I see you. Okay. Okay. The microphone isn't working. Here, come up here and ask from here. Okay. Well, my name is Shai Rizir. I'm an economics student. And I want to thank you for being here. I just had a question. Um, we have seen that since 9-11, the, the concept of terrorism has grown to be far larger than we thought in our wildest imaginations. And uh, this concept of terrorism obviously entails a very negative connotation that results in the majority of the time in people, as you said, readers. Uh, focusing their attention and their empathy on victims rather than studying and comprehending wh who the attackers are. And uh, I was going to ask you if you believe that how we overuse this concept of terrorism in media and journalism has created a kind of stereotypical reaction for every violent situation in the Middle East and therefore preventing further thought into understanding what really is going on and, as you said, what our alternatives, our real alternatives are. That's my question. I, yeah, I think the answer is no, and um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand, or I, I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. I think, I think you know, we, the media, and as far as I know, all the leaders of the free world were quite shocked by 9-11, and we have managed to continue to be shocked by the various things that have happened since then, uh, by, I guess, not understanding enough the places uh, the, full, the world and the complexity of the Islamist movements in the world and other phenomena in the world that have led to um, some of the horrible things that have happened. I, I think, I think the, the coverage, I think that uh, over those years, largely through the New York Times and other similar media outlets, there has been kind of remarkable uh, learning about what is going on. I mean, the coverage that my colleagues have been doing in the last few months about ISIS, it's amazing about what it's like to live in Raqqa, about uh, the financing of ISIS. Today, we, Ben Hubbard has a great story about, uh, about the failure of them, of the caliphate, essentially. So, you know, did the Arab Spring take us by surprise as journalists? Yes. Did the Arab Spring take the administration by surprise? Yes. So there's, you know, are we doing, does that mean we're not doing enough work to understand the Arab world and the Muslim world, or we weren't? Yes, we are now. Anyway, yeah. It's not a very satisfying answer, I'm sure. Comment on Netanyahu. 
I should comment on Netanyahu. <laughs> Um, my main comment about Netanyahu is that he should give me an interview before I leave. <laughs> Mark Regev, if you're listening. I ask Mark like every day to schedule my interview and that's how I told him I was leaving. I said, you have to schedule my interview with the Prime Minister the next month because I'm leaving. Um, my comment on Netanyahu, I mean Netanyahu is, I think, uh, <coughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, what shall I say about Netanyahu? Um, I think he is, is truly uh, about protecting Israel's security and protecting Israel as the nation state of, and homeland of the Jewish people. I think he is sincere about that. I think that is his uh, mission in political life and that he sees himself as a historic figure whose responsibility and legacy is to do just that. I think that um, it seems to me right now that it may be, I may prove, be, I may not be right about this, the Americans may be wrong about this, but it seems to me that some of his efforts to do that are blind to other to certain threats. He does seem he's in his focus on the Iranian nuclear threat, for example. He seems to me to not be spending enough energy on the threat to Israel from Israeli isolation, isolation internationally and boycott, and from the inability to sustain the status quo over the long term. He talks. I, I believe him when he says that he does not want a binational state. I do not think he uh, is fully engaged in fighting against that eventuality. I think the criticism of him of being risk averse uh, is reasonable. I think the notion that that is only about political cyber survivability is overstated. Um, what else? I don't know, those are some comments about Netanyahu. Oh, if there was a different Israeli leader, would, would what? Would there be better process, prospects for peace? I think, I think that the, you know, I think that, uh, I think that the, I do not see any other Israeli leader on the horizon who, you know, uh, would, you know, be able to broker a peace deal with the current Palestinian leadership in the short term. I think there are other leaders who could, uh, ch who, whose election might or elevation might change the world's uh, frustration with Israel and therefore some of the, the issues like the EU guidelines or like the resolutions at the UN or something. I think some of that, some of the kind of international criticism or either international support for Palestinians or criticism of Israel might be reduced if there was a, a different leader. And I, look, I think that, the, as I said before, Israel is in a tough spot in terms of with this Palestinian leadership and with other factors in the region. It is a tough, tough spot. Um, I do not see a, you know, fixing it is not easy. Um, and I think it does require some bold uh, leadership, risky moves, and so it's possible there would be another leader who might be more willing to take them, but maybe not, I don't know. Hi, um, as a pro-Israel student on campus, we really try to educate the student body and by reading many different sources and looking at what the media is saying and I mean, as you were mentioning earlier, and as we're thinking about things, emotions typically do get involved as pro-Israel students reading a headline, especially when it says like two um, Palestinians killed after attacking Israelis when it's framed in that regard. So wanting to know- Wait, what's wrong with that? So when they, when, by stating when the attackers are, when the Palestinians are killed first, then stating 
after they attacked Israelis, then it, we feel like it can sometimes turn around what is more important in saying that they're killed, they died, the Palestinians died, after attacking Israelis. So more so that the Israelis were attacked and then the Palestinians were killed by Israeli security or the IDF soldiers. And so would you, did you have a better headline in mind for you, what you said was two Palestinians killed after attacking Israelis. So in the same number of words, what would you have said? So Israelis attacked, Palestinian, uh, Israelis attacked by Palestinians, then the idea that the idea, the p part where the Palestinians died, coming second, because that is the secondary event that took place. Why on is a this, Why? If the Palestinian attackers, they're the ones who are the bad guys, and they're doing, and then and they're going forward and. Uh, taking that action first, then when the media portrays it this way, Israel seems like the bad guys. When what? I'm sorry, in a headline that says two Palestinians killed after attacking Israelis, in what way does that make Israelis look bad? Well, as we, I, I personally then think that when it is portrayed that way, Israel, Israel is trying to defend itself. Everyone has the right to defend themselves. But when Palestinians are walking around with knives and then Israeli security and IDF forces are killing them, then it is portrayed in the general media that Israel took that action sometimes first, if that's the way that the headline reads. So wanting to take the benefit, how? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In what way does it make Israel look bad to say two Palestinians killed after attacking Israelis? And, and the second question, if you can answer the first one, is in what way is that at all not true, based on the situation? That I, I, This is a mythical headline, I think, but anyway. In what way does it make Israel look bad? Because to me, it makes Israel look like a place that got attacked. Right, but... But it actually says, two Palestinians killed after attacking Israelis. So a person who is not trying to say, does this make Israel look bad, but is just trying to say what happened, would say some Israelis were attacked and their attackers were killed. That's the only way to read that headline. That's what that headline says. But then if we go back to the numbers game, where which I think a lot of people do look at if the at, as more Palestinians die and they see the number grow exponentially, that grow much faster than the number of Israelis killed, that they see Israel as the bad guy because more Palestinians are being killed in the conflict. I don't think that's true. Okay, so then my question, so how should that's we be reading why your Israel article look to like not- a bad guy for being attacked. How can Who we thinks Israel looks like a bad guy what, by writing that they're, I mean, when you say 100 Palestinians have been killed over the last two months, half of them after attacking Israelis, it looks to me like 50 Palestinians have been killed after attacking Israelis. That doesn't make Israel look bad. What about the 50 that didn't attack them? Well, those, and it's explained that those 50 were in violent demonstrations clashing with soldiers, which also, it's a little more mixed, but it's, it's it, you know, it's not, I don't think it necessarily makes Israel look bad. I think- So how can we be reading your article to not interpret it as Israel looking at, like the bad guy in well, the way that You could just read framed. the article instead of, you could just read the article. The one you just said, which is, again, I don't think it's a real article, but two Palestinians killed after attacking Israelis is a, sounds like an accurate description of what happened that does not make anybody look bad or good. It's just telling what happened. I think you're bringing to the thing a, a presumption and you're looking for something and you're trying to analyze things with a lens that is not helpful. And I have a question, another question for you. What does it mean to be a pro-Israel student? Agreeing that Israel has the right to exist as a democracy in the Middle East and has a right to defend itself. Okay. interesting exchange because I am a, a Jewish student on campus who sometimes feels alienated by the pro-Israel community. So I'm curious to know, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that you're, since your time, that you are a progressive person on Israel and I'm just curious if you could just uh, elaborate or like just shed some light on your experience as a liberal or a progressive Zionist or support of Israel and how that has, like what are the dilemmas and how, like, because you spoke about it a lot with the. So this is a, a Jewish student who is sometimes feels alienated by the pro-Israel crowd on campus and he and the, our previous friend can work it out afterwards. Um, and 
But let me ask you something. So do you think of yourself as pro-Israel? Maybe not as a pro-Israel on student on campus, but as pro-Israel in any way? Yeah, yeah. I think, and what does that mean to you to be pro-Israel? Well, I think it's a, it's a very nuanced position. I think I wholeheartedly believe in the Israel to, as a right to exist, but also totally disagree with the way that they treat the Palestinians and how they treat even other Israelis. So I think it's a very nuanced. Right, so a lot of people I know describe themselves as pro-Israel and define being pro-Israel, I'll help you out a little bit because it sounds like I'm, I'm guessing, uh, that they think being pro-Israel is about, as you said, believing Israel has the right to exist, but also uh, believing that their responsibility is to kind of wrestle with Israel's challenges and to uh, aggressively critique uh, Israel's policies uh, and to engage with it and to engage with sort of improving Israel in their own minds. Um, and I think that I'm just sort of interested. I think there's a lot of different definitions about pro-Israel, and I think the advocates have uh, some, some advocates have kind of seize that term for their own. I don't think it's so limited. Also Zionism, by the way. And then uh, the questioner said something about me being progressive and liberal and Zionist, which is stuff he seems to have made up out of his head, because I'm not any of those things. I'm just really a journalist who, uh, I don't think of myself as uh, progressive or liberal. I, j I really think of myself as just uh, someone trying to figure it all out. And to not figure out, to really figure out what other people yeah. do and say and think. Sounds like being a journalist. That's the, right, that's the idea. Um, so uh, we are immensely grateful for this exchange. I feel um, enormously enlightened. I feel like we have not gotten the full dual narrative, but we appreciate that there are multiple narratives and something of the challenges and work of journalism. And I just want to wish you such good luck Thank in your you. transition to your next opportunity, and we look forward to the work you do at the Foreign Desk. Um, I have a small commercial, and then we'll, I'll invite you to thank our speaker. Um, the small commercial is that uh, we are in the business of education, and Professor Dove Waxman, who is our Israel Studies professor, um, and to whom uh, Ms. Rudorin turned several times, and I, as the director of the Jewish Studies program, are leading a dialogue of civilizations program in Israel during the first summer session this, um, this year for the students here who are interested in a fuller, deeper, longer, on the ground exploration of, of the dual narratives. We would really urge you to apply. If you can't apply yourself, invite your friends to think about coming on this trip. We would like to increase our numbers. And on this Friday at 3.30, there will be an information, an information session that Dove and I will lead in Renaissance Park, room 310. I hope that you will consider this and help us promote it. And now, um, Jody Rudorn, thank you for thank the you. energy and intelligence. I'm taking my drain off.